Um, to me and my colleagues, we know Professor Arnson as a, one of the foremost translators of women's autobiographical writing from the classical Heian period of Japan, uh, 10th century, 11th century time period. Uh, Dr. Arnson uh, published a new translation of the uh, Kagero Diary um, in, two, in 1997. Uh, that was followed in 2014 by a translation of the Sarashina Diary with Ito Moriyuki. Uh, that proved so successful that a reader's edition was uh, published in 2018. And she is, I understand now, hard at work on a translation of a literary court romance from the period of the Ochikubo Monogatari that I am very eager to see the results of. Um, but tonight we are going to uh, learn from the other Sonia Aronson, uh, the more sinological Sonia Aronson, who uh, did her dissertation and published her first books on the Zen poet EQ. Um, her trans first trans, hmm, I, I don't actually know how these all work, but there was a translation of some of EQ's poetry from Western Washington College Press in 1973, even before she got her PhD. But then after her PhD, um, it, there was an addition from the University of Tokyo which is not bad. Um, so uh, what is particularly interesting about this evening, of course, is that uh, Sonia has remained very active, as I've suggested, uh, since retirement. Uh, she hasn't retired at all, actually. Uh, and she's taken the opportunity to go back to the EQ poems and redo them or arrange them or improve them. I think is what we can expect. So uh, I'm hoping we will hear both um, EQ and his poetry, and also uh, perhaps some of her reflections about re-engaging with EQ at that, that very profound and intimate level that is only achieved by actually trying to render their poetry into your own language. So I hope you'll join me in welcoming Professor Sonia Arts. Thank you for being here. Uh, the Thanksgiving uh, weekend uh, and uh, all the people online too. Thank you for for all tuning in and uh, and listening. Um, the talk. The let's go to the first slide. The topic is the poetry in literary Chinese uh, from the Crazy Cloud Anthology. Uh, which you see the Chinese characters there for Kyounshu of the Japanese Rinzai Zen monk, Ikkyu Sojung. Uh, and you see his dates there, 1394 to 1481. And this was originally going to be a, essentially a book talk because um, the original book, Ikkyu and the Crazy Cloud Anthology, which came out a long time ago, 1986, and has been out of print for almost 30 years, was reprinted just this year by Quirin Press, which is a press in um, Australia. The editors in Australia, they have a connection with Basel, Switzerland as well. And the title says Revise and Expand It. It was an extraordinary opportunity to go back and look at the, uh, the work of my youth and, uh, and see it again from very different perspectives. Uh, so there were insights that came and uh, many corrections, which I will talk about a little bit, not, not the corrections per se, but um, when it was fitted in to this uh, conference, this Buddhist conference on the notions of world ending in Buddhism, um, it, um, uh, it forced me to consider larger themes. Uh, and one of them that came to me was the connection between art and religion, which is really the connection between art and human beings. Uh, and this is art in its largest sense, 
the making, um, I have the name here of Ellen uh, Desanayake, uh, who is a biologist who has studied the role of art in the biological survival of our species. Uh, she, the, it's a, a novel way to look at art. We usually think of art as something of the elite, of, uh, you know, that comes with a sophisticated culture, but it's been with us since we have expressed our consciousness in caves, um, on uh, beaded buckskin clothing, the patterning and the patterning of words. So that uh, big uh, meaning of, of art. And um, it made me reflect on the role of Buddhist art. And in the case of Iku, it's poetry is the form of art. Uh, in helping people, and in this lecture, it will be this one poet, uh, to mentally cope with crisis. Uh, and for Ikkyu, poetry was both a spiritual practice and a means for surviving uh, difficult times. I think one of the reasons why it, it came to me in such big terms is that climate crisis, crisis pushes us to consider the sweep of human evolution and how we got to this place where who we are as a species risks bringing us to extinction with so many other forms of life. Um, and if we can't cope with the mental dimension of crisis, uh, then it's hard to deal with its practical um, sides. So now I'm, I'm not a theorist, I'm a literary translator. And so I just throw this big theme out and I'm not gonna come back and build upon it but I just throw it out there. Uh, and the, uh, again, the, the placement of this talk in the context of the conference um, made me concentrate on EQ's poem uh, in his uh, later life, in his 70s. Actually, I'm in my 70s now. It's the poems of his 70s, which were a very difficult time for him and for Japan. Uh, the, uh, there, he faced war, he became a refugee, uh, and, um, and also had other unexpected things happen to him, which I, I will get to, uh, although I'm not making this that much of a bio, biographical presentation. I really want to concentrate on this body of poems, a, a fairly small number of poems from this crisis period uh, in his life. So, uh, but I think for uh, some members of the audience, uh, perhaps an introduction to EQ is necessary. So I will give a brief uh, introduction to EQ. And uh, we have this, uh, can you see the light so the, the screen can be seen a bit better actually? Uh, he, he was the child uh, of a lesser consort of the Emperor Gokomatsu. So he, he was of noble birth, but uh, his, uh, his mother was not of such high standard and she was slandered. So she was sent sort of down to a commoner's household while he was, uh, before he was, he was born. <clears throat> and he was placed in a, a Rinzai Zen monastery at the age of six. Um, and of course, these two things go together. His mother lost all her standing. He, there was no prospects for him. And what you did with children in those days, often boy children anyways, was put them in uh, Rinzai uh, monasteries. They were like boarding schools uh, for, uh, for boys. And, uh, but the important point is that from the age of six, his entire education was in the Chinese language. And uh, it was not only, uh, now this is the Chinese written language, not the spoken language, but the written language, which uh, was the written language for across the, what's called the Sinosphere. It included Vietnam, China itself, of course, Korea, and, uh, and Japan, and parts of uh, Mongolia, maybe too. Um, but because it was also the Zen, an integral part of the Sinosphere, of a Chinese tradition. 
So he lived almost his entire life within an imagined China. And that's why you'll see all the references to his work are to Chinese uh, thinkers. Now, he was both uh, an inside and an outsider uh, of the Zen establishment. And uh, it's wonderful that we have this portrait of him that is a lovely portrait uh, by one of his disciples, Bokusai. And I think it speaks a thousand words. Uh, he's often described as an eccentric or a counselor. And you can see it his eyes. He was a sketch. This was not a formal Buddhist portrait. Uh, but, uh, and there's, there's a kind of haunted, troubled look uh, as well. Uh, and I won't go into the, he belonged to one of the large temples. He, uh, he was uh, studied to the point of being considered enlightened with a master who was on the fringes of uh, Daitokuji, uh, which is one of the biggest temples in Kyoto uh, now. Uh, and it was a big temple then, but it had been exalted. So it was sort of inside, but outside. And this is typical of IQ and his whole life, that he was inside the establishment, but also outside it. Um, and once he had uh, finished his, his uh, kind of um, training with uh, that master, uh, he spent most of his life living an itinerant lifestyle. So um, only staying at small hermitages, only rarely staying uh, at the big temple. Uh, and the other thing that's uh, good to know about him uh, is that he was a mentor to key artists of the period. Uh, dramatists, the tea ceremony I've mentioned, uh, poets, um, you know, people involved in garden design. He was uh, uh, sort of very connected with the uh, with the artists uh, around him, and he was one of the most famous calligraphers uh, of the age. And I've given uh, this is one of his pieces of calligraphy that he did often. And I didn't want to try to show you the detailed stories behind this one, but it has a very simple message: uh, Do no evil, do much good. The various evils, don't do them. Tomato matsa, suzen bugyo. Do the mass good. Um, um, as uh, one uh, Zen monk in Ikkyu's tradition was moved to say, uh, it's a teaching that uh, a three year old can say, but there are 80 year old men who cannot do it. <laughs> now, uh, we also need to know a little bit about his times to appreciate his poetry. The, uh, I'm not going to talk about it politically, but it was a, a fractured time, very weak central power, a warrior government, though. Uh, there was an emperor, but he was had very little power, and the emperor's court were puppets of a warrior government. Um, the, um, uh, there was friction between rival warrior factions. Uh, but one of the things that's interesting about the period is the political and cultural preeminence of Rinzai Zen as an institution. And sometimes we think that if, if an organization with a, with a fine philosophy is, uh, is politically influential, all will be well. But unfortunately, this wasn't the case in Borobachi. Uh, the Muromachi period, the, uh, the Rinzai Zen institution was hand in glove with the warrior government. They provided diplomatic and financial services. Um, they had a monopoly on the lucrative trade with Ming China. Uh, and I've, those three Chinese characters are money, boats, and Zen. And that's what that trade was about. Um, the uh, Zen monks were doing it, but it had everything to do with money, and it was conducted on boats. <laughs> uh, the uh, Ikkyu, at one point in his uh, career, when he was so disillusioned with the Zen institution of his days, he um, wrote a tract saying, I'm going to leave Zen, I'm going to become a Pure Land Buddhist, uh, and he wrote a hundred poems using those three characters as the rhyme words 
for all hundred pounds. Boats, zen, money. <laughs> um, they, from the money, from the, the trade, they diversified. Uh, uh, Rinzai Zen at that time was nothing um, more like a, um, uh, um, uh, you know, international corporation. Uh, so they plowed their money into sake brewing, which seems surprising for, for monks shouldn't drink sake, but that was never observed in Japan. That particular precept just precept just never took, um, and money lending. And I'll bring this slide back when I introduce the first poem of each year, uh, because uh, I'll, then I'll explain what acts of grace are. But on the positive side, uh, the Zen monastic institution was a conduit for the latest intellectual and artistic movements in China, um, really a creative focal point for new developments in painting, architecture, garden design, and kanshi. Kanshi is the main weapon of Sinitic poetry, poetry written in literary Chinese. Uh, and there was a mass of it written at this uh, time in Japan. Because the language of Buddhism, just like the language of Christian church in Europe, that was Latin, the language of the Buddhist uh, institution of all the schools of Buddhism uh, throughout the Sinosphere was Chinese. Now, this, uh, remember, Ikkyu died in 1481. The last part of his life was blighted by the Onion War, which broke out in 1467 to 77. It was a pointless, destructive war uh, that uh, ended with no winners. Are we familiar with this in our own time? <laughs> we, we are indeed. Uh, it was fought right in the central city of the central capital of the country in Kyoto and raised all the buildings in the middle part of the capital to the ground. To this day, um, people who live in Kyoto, who have long uh, histories in Kyoto, will say, you know, there's nothing very new, uh, very uh, old in Kyoto left uh, in central Kyoto because of the war, you know. And they don't mean the Second World War, in which Kyoto was mercifully spared, but they mean the Onin War, 1467 to 77. The Tofugiji was one of the great temples of that era, and its gate remained. It was in the southern end of the city, so that's from 1425, and that's why I put it on the slide. Now, back a little bit to The, uh, and uh, you can see all the stickies. That's the old book. And those are all the places that needed attention in one way or another. <laughs> so the, um, uh, actually, I can't see. I can't see. I'm going to turn it around a bit. I think I got it. Next, we have the Kimbo Palace. For those of you in the back, you can see the two books. Uh, and then the new one in uh, uh, 2022. And I've already said what a wonderful thing it was to be able to, to revisit it. So how did I get interested in EQ uh, in the first place? And it was on a whim in 1965, right here at UBC, long before this building, <laughs> long even before the Nitobe Gardens. <laughs> um, I signed up for a Japanese language course and a course in Japanese literature that was taught by Kato Shuichi. And here are some photos from, of Kato Shuichi from the Ritsumeikan University, which holds the archive of all his papers. Uh, a very interesting one, lots of material in English too. Many of you will know Shuichi uh, Kato's name. Uh, he uh, taught here at UBC from 1960 to 1969. Uh, he was a major spokesperson uh, for the post-war uh, generation in Japan. And uh, I'm going to read uh, right now from a memoir essay that I uh, uh, finished this presentation. Originally trained as a doctor, Kato left medicine to become a professional writer and published in many of the Japanese journals and newspapers. 
not in Mars, equally at home in French, German, and English. By the late 1950s, he was recognized as a leading spokesperson for the post-war generation in Japan. Of his reputation and influence in Japan, I knew nothing at the time. Nor was I aware that the program in uh, Asian studies at UBC was only uh, four years old. Uh, he actually joined uh, before the, uh, the university, before Asian studies was a formal department. As I learned in recent years, he was dis discovering and in many uh, senses making classical Japanese literature his own as he taught it to us. Actually, as he was teaching at UBC, he was publishing simultaneously in Japan, sending the articles uh, by mail, actually, to be published in the Mainichi uh, newspaper in Japanese. So that uh, because the post-war ge generation was feeling lost, all that they'd been taught about the past of Japan was up for grabs. It would all crumbled before their eyes. And so, he felt this need to revisit classical Japanese literature to find what are the real roots, uh, what are our real roots. So that's what made him uh, a very stimulating teacher. And uh, he didn't teach classical Japanese literature uh, in the traditional way, uh, and indeed in the new way it was being reinvented in the post-war era, um, the, uh, what's called kokubungaku, or the national literature. He took the nationalism out of it, and one of the ways he took the it had become nationalistic because all the writing in Chinese after the Second World War was kind of regarded not as Japanese literature anymore. All, the only literature that counted was that which was in vernacular Japanese. But Kato didn't uh, didn't hold with that because you lost a tremendous amount of your past if you did that. Um, and so that was why, uh, even though um, the, it was no longer considered appropriate to teach Chinese poetry written by Japanese as part of Japanese literature, he gave two lectures on Ikyu's poetry. And <clears throat> it was also uh, unusual because there weren't really any translations of Ikyu's poetry in English. And it was a Japanese literature in English course um, and he didn't have any translations to show us, but he told us about the poet and about uh, the, his poetry, and um, I was enthralled. Uh, and uh, after the second lecture, uh, uh, and I, so, and why was I enthralled? It was, here was a poet of bold expression, someone who loved passionately, got angry and protested the ills of his time. In the 1960s, these characteristics made EQ seem relatable and almost contemporary. And I think they still do. I told myself, someone has to translate this poet and let his voice be heard too as an authentic part of Japanese literature. So after the second class, I went up to Kato and I asked, um, do you think if I worked really hard, I could translate Ikyu's poems? Um, I've just started first year Japanese. <laughs> Those of you who know the languages know how, how, how naive a question that was. Uh, and I, I see like this was when he's older, but the smile, that was the smile he gave me. And he said, it will take you a while. <laughs> and it took 20 years. Uh, and at the end of it, I was a university professor. So, uh, now, I want to go back now to the Monomachi period. Oh, no. If you want to learn, <laughs> if you really want to know how long ago it was that I was working on EQ, look at this picture. This is me giving a lecture in 1976 at an artist's uh, cooperative here in East Vancouver, the Western Front Society. It's still online, by the way. You can still uh, listen to the whole hour and 50 minutes. I can't believe it. And I'm not going to talk that long this time. <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, if you'll notice, too, there's a glass of beer on the, on the table. Those were the days. <laughs> now, 
uh, back to the Muromachi period. And I'm going to start with the readings of Ikkyu's poetry. Uh, the, I mentioned that uh, the, the Zen monasteries were into money lending and not as a charity. Uh, and so the, uh, they lent out their rates at usurious rates. And uh, throughout the Muromachi period, there were riots where uh, debtors would get together and storm the capital demanding acts of grace, tokusei, which is the forgiveness of debts. And when that happened, the, the big Zen monasteries were the popular targets uh, of incendiarism. And so I, the first poem I'm going to read is one of Ikkyu's uh, protest poems the, uh, of, uh, about Tokusei, Acts of Grace. Uh, and I'll read the English. Robbers never strike poor houses. One man's wealth is not wealth for the whole country. I believe that calamity has its origin in good fortune. You lose your soul over a hundred thousand pieces of copper. Now, uh, this one poem I'm going to read you in Japanese because at that lecture in 1976, uh, a poet, uh, Roy Kyoka, um, asked a question. And he said, how, uh, how did Ikkyu sound out his own poems? And I hadn't studied that yet. And I knew that there were many, many different styles of, in a sense, translating simultaneously Chinese poems into Japanese. It's called kundoku, because the Japanese and the Chinese languages are as different as English and Japanese. So you have to rearrange all the grammar uh, to make them uh, make sense. And uh, uh, so I said, I, I don't think we can know how EQ sounded out the poems. Uh, but when I went to Japan and did the two years study, Hirano Sojo gave me a photocopy of the oldest manuscript of EQ's poems that had EQ's own autograph on it, which shows that he approved it. And it had the markings to show you how to transpose it into Japanese. And when I looked at it, I saw, I saw that it's not that different from how uh, modern scholars, they, they, tra they don't translate it into modern Japanese. It's a, it's a method that's been used for a thousand years in Japan. So it's a, it's a translation into classical Japanese. Um, and I also took up the study very briefly of Shigin, which is the art of chanting Chinese poetry in Japanese. And it gave me a sense for the oral uh, sound of it. And I can't duplicate that, but I can, uh, but Query and Press, one of the things that they insisted upon was that I provide romanization for these Chinese poems. And at first I, I wasn't so happy about it, but then as I worked through it and was putting all the romanizations in, many times it changed my translation. There were times when just the sound of the Japanese words, it was, that's what he meant. And so I was, I was actually quite grateful for that. And I just want you to hear what it would have sounded like in the Japanese of uh, Ikkyu's time. Zoku wa ganrai ie no hinnaru wo utazu. Kodoku no zai wa mankoku no chin ni arazu. Shinzuraku wazawai wa moto. It's, uh, that's lovely. <laughs> I, I don't mean my reading, but I, it really is. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, now we're into the set of poems. Uh, of that were written in the years leading up to and during the Onin War. And this is the second year of Kansho, which was uh, 1461. So it's uh, from six, five years before. And uh, again, as we, uh, we have noticed that often climatic or climatic 
aberrations precede conflict in the world. And this was uh, uh, a case in point where the, um, there had been bad harvest, there had been droughts followed by floods, which we are so used to uh, recently. Uh, and uh, there was, so there was mass crop failures and, uh, and starvation uh, in the streets and, the, uh, and in the villages. I'm only going to read two of the poems uh, and make brief comments uh, about them. Uh, but it's unusual to have poems about these, uh, these situ social situations uh, in the medieval period. In the years of Kancho, countless people dead, ancient spirits caught on the wheel of transmigration 10,000 eons. In the Nirvana Hall, there is no repentance. One still prays for long life and endless spring. Now the Nirvana Hall is the infirmary in a monastery. And uh, it's so poignant to me that he uh, EQ's recognition that even when you see starving people around you, if you're sick yourself, you still pray for your own health and, uh, and, and endless youth. It, the, um, so honest, I think. Yes. And this one, extreme pain of hunger and cold oppressing one body. Before my eyes, a hungry ghost. Before my eyes, a man. Within the burning house of the triple sphere, a five foot frame. This is 10 billion Mount Sumerus of suffering. So the relativity, the, the suffering within your own body and this sort of recognition of body, not only as mental, but of physical uh, suffering. And it makes me think of the, the witnessing of suffering, how important it is. Uh, and uh, particularly in Buddhism, of course, with the first noble truth being the recognition of suffering. Uh, this is a poem on a lighter uh, note. The 13th day of the eighth month of the first year of Bunsho, this is 1466, just the year before the war. Soldiers from the various provinces fill the capital. The members of my school do not know if it is peace or war. They might be called mindless clerics. Therefore, I composed a poem. All heaven, all earth battle. The time of great peace, all heaven, all earth are calm. I'm getting an internet. <laughs> misfortune, misfortune on the end of a, edge of a sword. The path followers of the monasteries find the path difficult to attain. So it, it's, a, it's a pun. Now, <clears throat> when the war broke out, Iku uh, went to a small hermitage he had to about 30 miles south of the city in the present, well, it was called even in those days too, Takigi. Um, it's now a temple, but in those days, it was just a little, a small residence, Shu on An. And um, during the war, people still were creating art and bringing uh, things for inscriptions to EQ. And this is a scroll of the Chinese Chan monk, Song Yuan who was one of the patriarchs in, um, in Ikkyu's tradition. He taught Xu Tang, who taught Daio, who was the first one who brought that lineage to Japan. And uh, uh, this was uh, a very uh, common form of art. Uh, the, well, uh, it was a, a form of veneration where you painted pictures, imagined pictures of the patriarchs to inspire yourself to their example. And um, however, one of the things that was touching to me in this one is the, the red lines mark the date. And the date says Onin 3. But uh, as was common in Japan in those days, uh, era names were changed frequently. Uh, if there were bad things happening, you changed the era name. So there were only two years in the Onin era. Uh, because the war broke out, they decided to change the name to Bumme. But people, even 30 miles away from the capital, didn't even know that the date had changed. So the, um, and this is one case, and I forgot to mention it earlier, IQ often um, signed his name. Uh, the, you can see it there, uh, 
with the green line beside it, that's the Eastern Sea. So uh, Ikkyu of the Eastern Sea. So even when he named himself, he named himself with a sense from looking at himself from within China, you know, because it's only from within China that he's to the east, you know, uh, and this is how much uh, the, a part of the, the sinosphere he felt himself to be. And here are the poems. The Zen of Master Song Yuan Lin Yin, by breaking the rules held to principle, saved a few coins. In my purse, not even a half a penny saved. This madman, rambling river to mountain, 30 years. And the second one, circumnabulate, bow, burn incense, raise the whisk, sound the block, sit on the carved chair. Where in all this is Rinzai's true transmission? EQ on the Eastern Sea, Renz is reaving, grieving guts. Uh, Rinzai was the founder of his lineage, the Chinese master of the ninth century, uh, uh, and Lin Qi is his Chinese name. Uh, and behind this poem, you can see uh, EQ's sense of the complicity of the institution that he was living in with the, the political situation uh, of his time and the circumnabulate bow incense, all the formal uh, ritual activities, but uh, not being true to the core. Now, uh, then uh, even Takigi was embroiled in the warfare, so he became a refugee. Uh, he had to leave Takigi and uh, traverse the mountains to get to safer areas. And uh, this one is such a hard going, hard to know how far I've come. Mountains are a vast quietude, so the waters say. 10,000 miles, 10,000 scrolls of writing. For the first time, I taste Duling spirit. And Duling is the great uh, Chinese Tang dynasty poet, Du Fu. Um, the, um, and I'll read the second poem, where again he refers to Duling. Whether in a mountain spirit realm or celestial palace, our nation is in the hands of villains, the roads impassable. So I recall dueling, sprinkling flowers with tears, autumn scent, golden chrysanthemum, on earth an acrid wind. And uh, the mountain spirit realm is actually an allusion to uh, a book of ko uh, koans, the, the Blue Cliff Record, uh, and it, uh, represented the enlightened mind. But in these two poems, I think it's interesting that for EQ, it was the sense that being a refugee on the run, even an enlightened mind, isn't the comfort that the words of a former poet in the same situation. Uh, <clears throat> Dufu was uh, held captive in Chang'an in the eighth century, uh, 755, with the war of, uh, with the Anushan rebellion. Uh, and uh, in this one instance, I wanted to give you the full poem that he's alluding to. So we'll uh, go to Du Fu's poem next. This one of, any of you who know Chinese literature will know this one. And uh, I remember in the, the 1970s seeing the first line, the state crumbles, mountains and rivers remain in a Japanese pictorial magazine about pollution. And they reversed it. They said, the state remains the mountains and rivers crumble. Yeah, the, uh, um, anyways, the state crumbles, mountains and rivers remain. <clears throat> the city in spring, grass and shrubs grow rankly, feeling the times flowers sprinkle tears, lamenting separation, birds startle the heart. The signal fires have burned continuously for three months. A letter from home would be worth a myriad pieces of gold. I scratch my white head, thinning the hair even more. Soon, there will not be enough to stand up in a comb, to a comb. Um, I, I don't know why it has always been so meaningful to me to hear the words of people of the past 600 years, 700 years away, who, uh, who express pain 
and yet you get release from it. And, um, and I don't know why it's important that it goes back so far in time, but it makes me feel connected with humanity on, uh, on a deep level. And if I try and explain it, maybe that's why, and that's why I've, I've loved pre-modern literature. <laughs> okay. Now, then something very unexpected happened, and I want to make sure. Am I, I'm going too long, am I? No, yeah. no, not quite. Okay. Um, on, I'm just going to read these two poems and then comment on them. On the 14th day of the 11th month, the, seventh, the second year of Bumme, 1470, so this is still the year after he was uh, traveling through the mountains, I traveled to Yakushido and heard the blind girl's love songs. Accordingly, I made a poem recording the occasion. I traveled leisurely to Yakushido and rejoiced there. A poisonous spirit swells in my belly. I blush not to be concerned about my hoary head. Singing her heart out in the bitter cold, sad beats lengthen the night. Poisonous spirit is an allusion to a, a love story about two monks, star-crossed monks. Um, and I, I, that allusion allows EQ to, to express ambivalence about feeling these attractions to this blind singer uh, at the same time as a receptivity. So, but I, I won't read that, that whole allusion. Now it goes on. I recall the old times living at Takigi. You heard of the renown of the king's descendant and loved him. For many years, old promises were forgotten, but now all the more I love the form of the new moon on the jeweled stairs, which is an allusion to a poem by Bai Jui, who talked about um, a autumn moon, full autumn moon on the jeweled stairs. But here it means the face of the, of the blind singer. And then this is very rare that he has afterwards, but this is an afterwards. Concerning the above, I lodged for some years in a small dwelling in Takigi. The attendant Mori, having heard of my appearance and manner, already had feel, held feel, feelings of affection for, for me. I too knew of it, but remained undecided until now the spring of Shinbo, 1471. By chance at Sumiyoshi, I asked her about her feelings. She replied in the affirmative. Uh, and so IQ found love during the war. Uh, and, but they were still on the run. Uh, it was a, the, a, a difficult time. And this is two poems of that, of the, uh, the crises they, they faced. My blind attendant Mori has strong feelings of love. She has refused to eat and may die. Out of an excess of pain and sorrow about it, I have made some poems. Bai Zhang's Ho extinguished the need for alms. And I'm going to give you this illusion now and then read it again. Bai Zhang was the Zen monk, he was mentioned in the earlier panel today, who came up with the rule of a day of no work is a day of no eating. And so he started the Zen monasteries growing their own food in the Tang Dynasty. Um, and of course, it does extinguish the need for alms as long as you've got a whole year to grow the food in. Bai Zhang's Ho extinguished the need for alms. With, the rice, with rice money, the old king of hell has never been liberal. The blind girl's love songs shame pavilion master. On Chu's terrace, rain at sunset. Drip, drop, drop. Now, pavilion master uh, is an allusion to uh, a story about an eccentric Zen master who um, was passing through a village and passed a bar, a pavilion bar. Uh, bars were always pavilions in, in China, second floor. Um, and he heard uh, one of the female entertainers, uh, courtesans, uh, singing a song, um, since, you, since your heart is not faithful, I might as well lose my heart uh, or give up my heart too. And, but heart mind, uh, in Chinese and Japanese, heart and mind are the same thing. When uh, Pavilion Master heard that, we, we don't know what his real name was, uh, he lost his mind in the good sense. 
and uh, and therefore was made truly mindless and thereafter called himself pavilion master. So EQ identified with him and from time to time signed himself as pavilion master uh, in identification with that eccentric monk. Now, I didn't get that illusion the first time round with this book and I made the pavilion master uh, the pavilion girls. <laughs> so those poems are wrong. There are three very wrong poems in the old book. <laughs> Um, and so there, there are some various corrections like that. And then uh, look, look at Zen within Nirvana Hall, long ago when Baijang, Baijang plied his hoe. There were nights of drunken revelry beneath painted screens, now facing the old king of hell, how to come up with rice money. But it seems Mori didn't die uh, and uh, they made it to safety, and this one, um, this the color of this isn't so good, uh, and I want to make. A, so this is the only portrait I know of a Zen monk that shows his lover. Uh, the uh, this is uh, her name was uh, Mori. Some people call her Mori. I chose to call her Mori. The Sino-Japanese. Uh, reading of her name would be Shin, Shin, Shinjoro was also possible. And you can see her cane, maybe you can from back there, you see her, her cane because she was blind and her drum, which he, um, uh, and then uh, an EQ above. Just a minute, let's try and move the screen. Why aren't we, yes. Maybe not, it's okay. We'll go back. Whoops, not that far. <laughs> Mateo. Ah, just a minute. I need to get it back. Do you want to? Okay. <laughs> An intervention, yeah. Um, it's the only portrait. Woman. And this represents. A paradox in Zen, enlightened people aren't supposed to have attachments. Love is an attachment. Um, the, the, uh, and yet he's portrayed in a circle, uh, and this is his own writing, and he did the writing of her Japanese poem too. Within the circle appears a whole self. The painting expresses Shu Tang's true features. Shu Tang was another patriarch of the lineage. The blind girl's love songs shame pavilion master. They shame me uh, because she was willing to die, uh, giving up food so that he could live. Uh, and the uh, one song before the blossoms equals 10,000 years of spring. Now her poem is not so happy. Sleep of yearning on this bed of sorrow sleeping, I float, I sink, but for tears, there is no consolation. Life was hard for female entertainers. <laughs> and this brief period with EQ where they cohabited, she probably knew could not last so long either. Uh, and we're getting to the second to the last poem. I put this one in because of Kurt Spellmeyer's paper that will be given tomorrow um, that reminds us that the, uh, the notions of uh, dharma ending, this kind of a final ending to, uh, to time is very much a Judeo-Christian and a Muslim way of thinking that has begun to impact Buddhism itself. Uh, in, in Buddhism, uh, the, it was a cyclical sense of time that was uh, that was um, came from the Hindu religion uh, originally and Maitreya of course is the Buddha of the future um, and there was something enormously comforting about no matter how bad things were there would be an ending but there would be a beginning and it, things would start again you know uh, there would be even after Maitreya there would be more uh, uh, Buddhas so um, I, I put this one in for uh, just to give an example uh, of that kind of thinking in Ikkyu's poetry. Blind Mori every night accompanies my singing. Under the covers, Mandarin ducks, intimate talk always new. 
promise anew to meet in the dawn of Maitreya. Here at the home of the old Buddha, all things are in spring. Another very rare thing in Japanese poetry is happy love poetry. And this is one. And finally, this one, a vow taken to repay my deep debt to Lady Mori. The tree budded leaves that fell, but once more round comes spring. Green grows, flowers bloom, old promises are renewed. Mori, if I ever forget my deep bond with you, hundreds of thousands of eons without measure, may I be reborn as a beast. So I leave you with EQ's poem of gratitude on the eve of Thanksgiving Sunday. This holy day, holiday, fete, that has been learned and appropriated from the indigenous people of this continent. Surely, the cultivation of gratitude is part of the trans transformation needed by humanity to overcome the crisis we face today. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.